is it? Yes, it is. So, welcome. Uh, we're going to be reading uh, the English Standard Version. Keyword Study Bible. Um, let me just turn. What is this again? Let me just turn that up a little bit. Hopefully you can hear me. Hopefully I'm not too loud. Hopefully the sound is good. Um, all right, let's get started. 5.16. So let me just set my clock. We're going to start in Genesis. I don't know if I should read the preface or not. Okay, we are going to read the preface, but before I do, let's pray. Okay, let me, okay. Okay. Whew. Thank you, Lord, for this day. I thank you for being with me. I thank you for waking me up this morning, Lord. I ask you just to be with me as I read. I ask you to help me to read clearly and relaxed. Um, and let me just do this how you want me to do it. Nice and easy. Simple. Um, and I thank you, Lord, be with us in Jesus name. Amen. All right. So AMG preface, the Hebrew Greek keyword study Bible in the English standard version is our latest endeavor to accomplish the goal of which AMG publishers was established to make key aspects of the original languages in which the Bible was written available and understandable for everyone. The Old Testament was, origi was originally written in Hebrew and Aramaic. The New Testament was originally written in Greek. This Bible will help you understand the vocabulary and syntax of those languages, whether or not you have had any formal training in them. The Bible uses the numbers of James Strong's numbering system to identify keywords of the original languages. We have included AMG's anointed Strong's dictionaries in the back of the Bible. So when the reader finds a word in the text with the Strong's number after it, all they have to do is look up that word in the appropriate dictionary. One dictionary for the Old Testament and one for the New Testament. If the Strong's number in the biblical, if the Strong's number in the biblical text is a bold number above the text, that means that the entry for that word has more material than Strong provided. Additional information from one of AMG's complete word study dictionaries has been added to that entry significant elements of Greek 
syntax are identified by the use of grammatical codes in the English text of the New Testament. In the pages following the New Testament, these codes are explained in detail in the grammatical notations. Again, these explanations are clear and understandable even if you have never studied the Greek language. I want to thank Henry Whitney, Jason Hughes, Elvis Ramirez, and all the other fine people associated with Scribe who helped to make this Bible a reality. I would also like to thank Trevor Overcash for his help in proofreading the material. Although we have labored to make this work free from error, we are not infallible. If you should find a mistake, please let us know. Warren Baker, D-R-E. Okay, so let's go ahead. That was the A-N-G preface. Which are the um, the creators of this particular Bible? Uh, so we will read the ESV preface. ESV stands for English Standard Version. So this Bible is the most valuable thing that this world affords. Here is wisdom. This is the law. This is the royal law. These are their lively oracles of God. With these words, the moderator of the Church of Scotland hands a Bible to the new monarch in Britain's coronation service. These words echo the King James Bible translators who wrote in 1611, "God's sacred word is that inestimable treasure." inestimable treasure that excel that excelleth all the riches of the earth this assessment of the bible is the motivating force behind the publication of the english standard version translation legacy it's But we just read that paragraph and we're moving on to the translation legacy paragraph. The English Standard Version, ESV, stands in the classic mainstream of English Bible translations over the past half millennium. The fountainhead of that stream was William Tyndall's New Testament of 1526, marking its course for the King James Version of 1611, the English Revised Version of 1885, the American Standard Version of 1901, and the Revised Standard Version of 1952 and 1971. In that stream, faithfulness to the text and vigorous pursuit of accuracy were combined with simplicity, beauty, and dignity of expression. Our goal has been to carry forward this legacy for a new century. To this end, each word and phrase in the ESV has been carefully weighed against the original Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek to ensure the full the, to ensure the fullest accuracy and clarity and to avoid under translation or overlooking any nuance of the original text. The words and phrases themselves grow out of the Tyndall King James legacy and most recently out of the RSV with the 1971 RSV text providing the starting point for our work. Archaic language has been brought to current usage and significant cor corrections have been made in the translation of key text but throughout our goal but throughout our goal has been to retain the depth of meaning in enduring language that have made their
indelible marking on the English-speaking world and have defined the life and doctrine of the church over the last four centuries. Okay, moving on to translation philosophy. The ESV is in essentially literal translation that seeks as far as possible to capture the presence to capture the precise word, wording of the original text and the personal style of each Bible writer. As such, its emphasis is on word-for-word -word correspondence, at the same time taking into account differences of grammar, syntax, and idiom between current literary English and the original languages. Thus, it seeks to be transparent to the original text, letting the reader see as directly as possible the structure and meaning of the original. In contrast to the ESV, some Bible versions have followed a thought-for-thought thought rather than word-for-word -word translation philosophy, emphasizing dynamic equivalence rather than the essentially literal meaning of the original. A thought-for-thought -thought translation is of necessity more inclined to reflect the interpretive thought, the interpretive opinions of the translator and the influences of contemporary culture. Every translation is at many points a trade-off between literal precision and reliability between formal equivalence in expression and functional equivalence in communication and the ESV is no exception. Within this framework, we have sought to be as literal as possible while maintaining clarity of expression and literary excellence. Therefore, to the extent, therefore to the extent that plain English permits and the meaning in each case allows we have sought, wait a minute, therefore to the extent that plain English permits and the meaning in each case allows, we have sought to use the same English word for important, important recurring words in the original. And as far, and as far as gram grammar, and syntax allow, we have rendered Old Testament passages cited in the New in ways that show their correspondence. Thus, in each of these areas, as well as throughout the Bible as a whole, we have sought to capture the echoes and overtones of meaning that are so abundantly present in the original text. As an essentially literal translation, then, the ESV seeks to carry over every possible nuance of the meaning in the original words of scripture into our own language. As such, the ESV is ideally suited for in-depth study of the Bible. Indeed, with its emphasis on literary excellence, the ESV is equally suited for public reading and preaching, for private reading and reflection, for both academic and devotional study, and for scripture memorization. Translation principles and style. This is a new one. The ESV also carries forward classic translation principles in its literary style. Accordingly, it retains ethological term terminology words such as grace, faith, justification, sanctification, redemption, regeneration, reconciliation, propitiation, 
because of their central importance for Christian doctrine and also because the underlying Greek words were already becoming keywords and technical terms in New Testament times. The ESV lets the stylic, stylistic variety of the biblical writers fully express itself from the exalted from the exalted prose that opens Genesis to the following narratives of the historical books to the rich metaphors and dramatic imagery of the poetic books to the ringing rhetorical indictments in the prophetic books to the smooth elegance of Luke to the profound simplicities of John and the closely reasoned logic of Paul in punctuating yeah in punctuating paragraphing dividing long sentences and rendering conne connectives the ESV follows the path that seems to make the ongoing flow of thought clearest in English the biblical languages regularly connect sentences by frequent rep repetition of words such as and, but, and for in a way that goes beyond the conventions of literary English. Effective translation, however, requires that these links in the original be reproduced so that the flow of the argument yeah, that the flow of the argument will be transparent to the reader. We have therefore normally translated these connections, though occasionally we have varied the, render the rendering by using alternatives such as also, however, now, so, then, or thus, when they better capture the sense in specific instances. In the area of gender language, the goal of the ESV is to render literally what is in the original. For example, anyone replaces any man where there is no word corresponding to man in the original language. The people rather than men is regularly used where the original languages refer to both men and women, but the words man and men are retained where a male meaning component is part of the original Greek or Hebrew. Likewise, the word man has been retained where the original text intends to convey a clear contrast between God on the one hand and man on the other hand with man being used in the collective sense of the whole human race see Luke 2 and 52 Similar, similarly the English word brothers translating the Greek word adelphoni is retained as an important familial form of address between fellow Jews and fellow Christians in the first century. A recurring note is included to indicate that the term brothers, Elder Adelpho E. Hmm, I wonder if I'm saying it right. A D E L P H O I. Adelphoi was often used in Greek to refer to both men and women and to indicate the specific instances in the text where there is the case. In addition, the English word sons, translating the Greek word huoi, what? Huoi is retained in specific instances because the underlying Greek term usually includes a male meaning component 
and it was used as a legal term in the adoption and inheritance laws of the first century Rome. As used by the Apostle Paul, this term refers to the status of all Christians, both men and women, who having been adopted into God's family, now enjoy all the privileges, obligations, and inheritance rights of God's children. The inclusive, the inclusive use of the generic he has also regularly been retained because this is consistent with similar usage in the original languages and because an essentially literal translation would be impossible without it. In each case, the objective has been transparency to the original text, allowing the reader to understand the original on its own terms rather than on the terms of our present day culture. Mm -hmm. Translation of specialized terms. Okay, so the preface is almost finished. Okay. As an essentially literal translation, then the... Wait a minute, I did that already, did I? Yes. Okay. The translation of specialized terms. In the translation of biblical terms referring to God... The ESV takes great care to convey the specific nuances of meaning of the original Hebrew and Greek terms. First, concerning terms that refer to God in the Old Testament. God, the maker of heaven and earth, introduced himself to the people of Israel with a special name. The consonants of which are YHWH. See Exodus 3:14 through 15. Scholar calls scholars call this trans. Wait a minute. Scholars call this tetragrammation. Tetragrammation, a Greek term referring to the four Hebrew letters YHWH. The exact pronunciation of YHWH is uncertain because the Jewish people considered the personal name of God to be so holy that it should never be spoken aloud. Instead of reading the word YHWH, they would normally read the Hebrew word Adonai, Lord. And the ancient translations into Greek, Syriac, and Aramaic, and Aramaic also follow this practice. When the vowels of the word Adonai are placed with the constants, no, consonants of YHWH, this resolution in the familiar word Jehovah that was used in some earlier English Bible translations. I will read that sentence again. When the vowels of the word Adonai are placed with the consonants of YHWH, this results in the familiar word Jehovah that was used in some earlier English Bible translations. As is common among English translations today, the ESV usually renders the personal name of God, YHWH, with the word LORD printed in small capitals. Mm -hmm. An exception to this is when the Hebrew word Adonai appears together 
with YHWH, in which case the two words are rendered together as the Lord in lowercase, God in small capitals. In contrast to the personal name of God, YHWH, the more general name for God in the Old Testament, Hebrew, is Elohim. And its related form of El or Eloah, all of which are normally translated God in lower case letters. The use of these different rays to translate the Hebrew words or God is especially beneficial to the English reader, um, enabling the reader to see and understand the different ways that the personal name and the general name of God are both used to refer to the one true God of the Old Testament. Second, in the New Testament, the Greek word Christos has been translated consistently as Christ, although the term originally meant anointed among Jews in the New Testament times, the term came to designate the Messiah, the great Savior that God had promised to raise up. In other New Testament contexts, however, especially among Gentiles, Christos, Christ, was on its way to becoming a proper name. It is important, therefore, to keep the context in mind and understanding the various ways that Christos, Christ, is used in the New Testament. At the same time, in according with its essentially literal translation philosophy, the ESV has retained consistency and concordance in the translation of Christos, Christ, throughout the New Testament. Third, a particular difficulty is presented when words in the Biblical Hebrew and Greek refer to ancient practices and institutions, and institutions that do not correspond directly to those in the modern world. Such is the case in the translation of Abed, Hebrew, and doulos greek terms which are often rendered slave these terms however actually cover a range of relationships that require a range of renderings either slave bond servant or servant depending on the text further the word slave currently carries associations associations with the often brutal and dehumanizing institution of slavery in the 19th century America. For this reason, the ESV translation of the words abed and doulos have been undertaken with particular attention to their meaning in each specific context. Thus, in the Old Testament times, one might enter slavery, therefore voluntarily e.g., or example, to escape poverty or to pay off a debt, or involuntarily, e.g., by birth, by being captured in battle, or by judicial sentence. Protection for all and servitude in ancient Israel was provided by the Mosaic Law. In New Testament, Protection for all in servitude in ancient Israel was provided by the Mosaic Law. In New Testament times, a doulos is often best described as a bondservant, that is, as someone bound to serve. In the New Testament times, a doulos is often best described as a bondservant. That is, as someone bound to serve his master for a specific, unusually lengthy period of time. Mm. For a specific, usually lengthy period of time. But also as someone 
who might nevertheless own property, achieve social advancement, and even be released for purchase, even be released or purchase his freedom. Just because of how this is set up. <laughs>